Okay, looks like we're recording back with the three eldest siblings for more tales of their crazy adventures of childhood. Hey, so one of the coolest things we, with, well, we'd have cousins come visit and one of the coolest things is when Anita would come and we had one of those cheap metal swing sets with like the, where you, there's two seats that like this and you face each other. And she'd get up on the bar that held the leg of the swing set and just push it. And we'd sit in there and we would go so high. And if she was standing on it, it would keep the swing set from otherwise like lifting off the ground. Do you guys remember that? I don't. Oh yeah. Do yeah. <laughs> Nia, and, wing me, Nia. Yeah. Wing me, Nia, wing me. That was probably Sean that would say that, but I think it was me. That's what she always told me. Was it? I don't know. I remember us being older mm. than you and big enough to say it, but maybe we still just said it afterwards. And then something else I remember about cousins is Harold and Lara would come visit. And I don't remember how many kids they had at the time, but they ended up with like 12. And they'd pull up in their big van and the doors would open and those, because they had all boys for years. They had probably nine or so boys before they had a girl. And it was like- Well, Ellen was my age. Okay. Well, there were probably- But you're right, they had a lot of boys. They probably had six or seven boys older than she is. But they, so they pull up and the door would open and they were city kids and they would just scatter. Like if you dropped a beehive or something and they just, and they'd, you wouldn't see him again. And then about an hour later, Harold would be ready to go and he'd either holler or whistle. I don't remember which. And then they'd all just come back and ride in the van and we never interacted with them when they came to our house. They were just off roaming through the trees and the gully and so they were city kids and you were country kids yeah it's kind of weird to think country kids from provo well we were technically we weren't even in provo city we were in provo <laughs> county and the only way that i was able to get a provo city library card is because i attended a school in provo school district because we didn't live in technically in city limits we had a rural, we had a route box, route two box something, or maybe it was route one. Yeah, rural route was our address, yeah. postal address. Yeah. Was University Avenue paved or was it dirt road back then up, up that far north? No, it was paved all the way up the canyon like it is now, but so this, this blows people's mind. So Shadowbrook was in our ward and that was fairly recently built. And then the ward went up the canyon to Deer Creek. So Wildwood, Sundance, Aspen Grove, Vivian Park, all of that was our ward. And from where Carterville drops off and from where Canyon Road drops off. And when I was really little, even some of the stuff up on the bench on Canyon Road was in our, was in our ward. It was so nothing else there. Well, University Avenue was a two lane road. And I remember by Wills when they finally put in a blinking light. Yeah, and Wills so wasn't that, So that you could actually cross the street if you had to. But mom and dad, I think, probably remember when they put University Avenue in. I think they lived there before it went all the way through. But I think it had been, way before that, it had been a nicer road. Cause, and there's kind of some of those older houses now that are... A lot of them have been taken down, but 
kind of up where the student, where they've been turned into student housing. And I remember Grandma Faulkner saying once, oh, when I was young, I wanted to live on the avenue. It just felt so fancy to live on the avenue. And then they ended up not very far from it once it was built. But I always remember it being a paved road. I think I think mom told me it once when they first moved there it wasn't or something like that all the way up to I, there. I house. think you're right. I think it didn't even go all the way through there. But the river bottoms it was rural. And um a lot of the river bottoms were church owned farms. And we would go as a ward and take our turn picking fruit for the welfare farms and whatever. And I mean, the whole ward would show up and climb cherry trees or apple trees or whatever and just pick fruit for an evening. And they'd have it in, was it the cherries? They, I remember there were these huge tubs of water and you'd put the fruit in those to kind of rinse off and your hands would be so sticky and so you could kind of rinse off in those tubs filled with water and fruit that was bobbing around in it. Yeah. I'm gonna... Another interesting thing about... Go ahead. No, oh, you're good. Another interesting thing about that time was we went to church in the morning and we went to junior... Sunday school actually passed the sacrament and you would take the sacrament and the adults would be in their classes and then they would go home or we would all go home and then later you would come back to sacrament meeting and you would have the sacrament again and then primary was held on a weeknight after school yeah, and when, once in a while, we would food to go out and eat just to make three layer ketchup sandwich. <laughs> 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 but, and when church was split like that, um, priesthood meeting was earlier Sunday morning. So dad would go to church and these might not be exact times. I'm, it's just an, as an example. So dad would get up and go to church at like 8 a.m. And then mom would get the, all the kids ready and go at nine. And then we'd all come home at 10 and then go back at like two for sacrament meeting. Kind of a deal. They changed that when we lived in Idaho right after we moved to Shelley. So I was probably about 13, 13 or 14. Uh, I should probably have Willis tell a couple stories, but um, one is we move. driving around, driving um, east from where Willis Pit Stop is now, there was a corner to turn. And if I remember right, Willis fell out the door of the van we had owned one night. Yeah, it was kind of a cold night. It was probably this time of year, yeah. sort of wintry. And I was sitting in the co-pilot of this With Dodge the, van. We were both in the seat. And we went around the corner and the door flung open and I went flying out. and. I remember wearing my very favorite hat. It was a green stocking cap, but I didn't really get very hurt. But I, I mean, it hurt. I don't know. Maybe I had a concussion looking back, but I remember bawling and having a headache and being scared, flung out in the gravel in the dark at night. And I remember freaking out. Willis just fell out. Stop, stop. It wasn't Halloween, right? I don't think so. <clears throat> Seems like it might have been near Halloween. We we were coming home from the Provo Public Library where we heard like the 
Toad and the Frog and Ichabod. And so it was Halloween time with Halloween stories. Okay. And then our dad went to uh, Canada and went bear hunting, ended up with uh, a bear rug. Uh, and somewhere along the line, our Uncle Jim came and decided to be funny, I guess, and put the bear rug over himself and went to knock on the door to neighbors. I don't know if he knocked on the door, but he was at a neighbor's house and there was at least one woman who lived there and someone who knows the story better than me can tell it. I only know the story secondhand. I think there were girls he was kind of interested in dating. So the, the funny part of the story to me is at some point, supposedly Jim's outside with his bear rug on and a hand comes out the door with a gun in it. And the gun is like waving around, but there's no, whoever's holding the gun isn't looking. They can't see what, they're, what they might be shooting at. And so Jim got the heck out of there because he realized he would likely get shot trying to play his prank on these girls. <laughs> Did it, you guys get scared by the bear rug? No, we would we would play with it. We'd put it on and crawl on our hands and knees around the front room and stuff. But I don't think it was ever scary as it was just fun. Well, who got, I, who got scared? I think it? Sean's the one who invented trying to scare people in it. Mm. Oh. Well, I'm kind of surprised Dad didn't warn Jim not to do that. Cause, and I don't remember the Scared story. younger. But, well, there was a time Dad was in Island Park and had a, I didn't even find this out until within the last five years before he passed away, but they actually ended up with like the head of the bear and they were like putting it up, like scratching at people's windows in Island Park and then waving the bear head on a pole or something by the windows. And yeah, he came pretty darn close to getting shot too. Mm. Uh, I, I think it's interesting that we had two vehicles while we were there that I don't remember very well. Uh, Dad had what he called a Terra Tiger, and it was basically a a little body, kind of a, a tub like body, and it had six wheels, six big like ATV wheels, and so you could drive it and go over stuff, and you could drive it into water. And it would actually float and propel itself a little bit. I don't think he had it very long. And then when we were there, he had a Traxter. And the Traxter was the same little thing, just not a very big machine, but it had tracks like a tank. And it had two handles that you would pull and push to steer it like you would some of those caterpillars. And I don't know why he had it or what, but he had it for a little while. And I remember riding in that and it would go anywhere. But well, Nassau's had those too, and they they were always into weird little vehicles and stuff. I think that's why Dad had them. Wasn't the Ter I thought the Terra Tiger was Dad's, and he took it to the South. I remember being in the Port of River in it, it's taking on a little bit of water in the bottom, and I was pretty I was pretty nervous, but we were fine. So I know he had taken it to Idaho at least once, and I thought he had gone all the way to the south with it, but it's super possible David had one too, because yeah, he always had the gadgets. Uh, I have just one more memory from Provo for sure. And we had dad's friends would come and talk about last time rope, rope horses and whatever. And so Willis and I were deciding to be ropers. So we took turns. One would ride his bike down the little lane and the other one would try and rope as they rode past. And I don't know how old I was. I couldn't have been more than six or seven probably. And I tried to rope Willis once and um, somehow I got his handlebar. I don't know where his hand went, but I got his handlebar and I wasn't smart enough to let go of the rope. So I held on to the rope and it jerked his handlebar sideways and he crashed in the driveway and I remember feeling pretty awful about uh, bringing him down in the, in the driveway. Well, 
Yeah, you, Justin, learned to ride a bike when you were about three. You were little. You were really little when you could ride a two-wheel bike all by yourself. We had a sweet banana seat bike that I remember riding in the fields out there. Yeah, I loved bikes. And then somewhere while we were still there, I think our neighbors had swing bikes. And it's a bike where you can detach the back wheel from the front wheel so they can ride and you can swing your back wheel back and forth like this and keep your front wheel straight. And I would love to find one of those in today's world if I could, but. They're everywhere. I know a few people who have them. Lunskog restored one that's in really good shape. Mm. But Lance Faulkner had five, the neighbor you were talking about. He had one in every color. They, they, were, they were made in Logan. Well, when dad once was in Idaho, I'm sorry, Canada, hunting bears with our cousin, Bob Young, Justin was given the blessing on the food and he said, bless dad, bless Bob and bless the bear. <laughs> I, had a, I had an imaginary friend back then and I called him my boyfriend named Scott. And I don't know how many stories I told or how elaborate I was, but I was, I had this friend that was my sidekick. Um, and I got these cowboy boots and I remember talking tough to mom saying something about, I was going to put on my cowboy boots and kick a polar bear in the ditch. Yeah. Your point boots. Cause they had pointy toes. So you and your boyfriend named Scott were going to put on your point boots and kick the polar bear into the ditch. I don't remember much about my boyfriend named Scott. Did, do you guys have any real, like, did that last a month or a week or was it a? Um, it was, it wasn't super long, but it was probably more than a week or so. Hmm. I'll bet it was at least six months. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. Why did you have to call him your boyfriend? Well, he could do everything. <laughs> <laughs> the two of you could do about anything. Mm. Yeah, you were riding that little green. We had that little green bike that didn't have a coaster brake. So you always had to pedal. If the wheel, if the rear wheel was turning, the pedals had to be going and Lisa and I are always playing around on it because we would we would ride it to Mariotti's and you could high center with the training wheels over puddles and just pedal pedal and the puddle would throw water in the air and like stream it up your back and I don't know who took the training wheels off but the training wheels were, were removed and you learned to ride it and you could ride before either of us could ride a two-wheeler yeah well <clears throat> dad found he showed up at the house one day with a bunch of bikes and i don't think that was one of them but there was one and it was a big blue bike and it had a little those little license plates on the back that are bike license plates and it said disneyland lisa so he bought it for me because it had my name on it and it was too big for me and so I was trying to ride it and it was too big and I fell off. And this was before the stagecoach was in that little dip at the side of the driveway. And there was a bunch of old uh, metal from a fence gate. And so I fell into that and got pretty banged up and scratched up and bleeding. And so then I was really scared to wear, ride a bike. I didn't I probably didn't ride a bike till I was in about the fifth grade because I was scared of them after that for a while. And then by that time I had grown into that bike and then I learned to ride it one morning. Didn't you get slivers too? <laughs> Pop probably. Didn't you get some slivers too? Um, probably. We talked about our, our horse, Laurie, dad's mare. And I remember being out in the field where the cherry orchard was and Stephanie from up above came to visit with her little pony and 
I don't remember riding Laurie a bunch, but I remember riding Laurie that day. And I, my memory is I was running, we were running side by side, Laurie and that pony. And I don't know who was riding the pony, probably Stephanie. And her horse kind of kicked at Laurie. And so uh, whether Laurie reacted or what, I don't know. I, I fell off and at least hurt my pride, probably went in the house crying. And then the next thing I know, Lisa's coming in the house screaming because she rode the horse under the apple tree and a branch like dug through her back and like, I don't know if it cut it open or just took the skin off, but it was like two back to back injuries in a very short amount of time. Well, and when she went, when Laurie went under the apple tree, she wasn't, yeah, she wasn't as well behaved with this other stupid horse around. And I was trying to get her to stop and go back and she went right under it. And I flattened and laid as flat on her as I could, but, but there was about this much too little clearance. And it just, yeah, that, the branch of that apple tree just tore my back up. <clears throat> So I don't think we rode with Stephanie much after that. Around that time, somehow mom bought um, Justin and I tank tops. I remember wearing these tank tops because I remember riding Laurie with a tank top, but I also remember getting really sunburned and I'd never had sunburnt shoulders before because I'd never worn a tank top. So what cars do you remember that mom and dad drove while we lived at that place? We had the white Ford. We had the white VW bus. We had dad's red truck, the Chevy. And then they remember they bought, he bought a like the precursor to a suburban, the Jimmy. I remember that. And a, and a park there and, Ever him driving it. And he, he had a blue Chevy pickup too, right? He got that in Idaho. Okay. And then there were some older that I don't remember, but or they had some uh Suburban or not suburban station Probably wagon. A Fairlane or a Falcon or something. Yeah. It wasn't a station wagon, it was just a sedan. But they had, yeah. So anyway. But good thing that there weren't ever seat belt or car seat rules then. And we had the white bus when Jess was born. Oh, this is a good story. So we were in Lava for the family reunion and mom was due in a month or more. And Anita was up there with a boyfriend and was coming home early and mom just kind of wasn't feeling well. So she came home early with, with Mark, Anita's boyfriend, Mark and Anita and Edith and mom was driving and got about to the Idaho Utah border and started feeling labor start. So she, and at this time the speed limit was probably 55. So she started going a little faster and a little faster and a little faster and she could tell it was getting closer and closer. And at this point, I-15 didn't go all the way through and you had to stop in Tremonton and meander through the fruit stands in Brigham City. And so she was going a little faster and she finally said to him, um, if I get pulled over, you need to back up my story, I'm in labor. So then Mark insisted on driving. And of course, Edith was being Edith the whole time. and complaining and singing and rah, rah, rah about something and and uh they got to the hospital and Anita went in with mom and mom's water broke in the elevator on the way up and Jess was born right after that 
And so then of course, <clears throat> Anita had to kind of deal with that. And I think she got stuck with probably Sean and Joseph and Ruth. I, I, cause dad and the rest of us were still in Idaho and we were, the three of us were over at John and Margie's and dad drove over in the van and got us in, or the bus, the Volkswagen bus and got us in and told us that we had a new little brother. And I think it was Willis was so excited. You jumped and cracked the overhead light with your head. Or was that you, Justin? Anyway, so just had a, just had an interesting birth story and he and he was a preemie and small and scrawny did mom ever get pulled over oh yeah so mark was actually driving he he and and they were about an exit away or two they i think they were in orem and they got pulled over and and mark said well, she's in labor, we're getting her to the hospital. And mom started to get out of the car thinking the cop was going to take her. Um, and and he, she said he clearly didn't want to be delivering any baby. He said, okay, just keep going, but be careful. So they didn't get a police escort, but they did get pulled over. <coughs> so do we need to talk about Moving to Shelley and the the little uh, well, the transition from the house in Shelley to Jameson. Yeah. yeah. If you want to, if you're done with, if you're done with Edgemont. Um, I can't really think of anything else off the top of my head about Edgemont. We just. I don't know. I guess if something comes up, we could probably jump back. We don't have to stay completely linear, linear, but. Well, we should talk about a couple of the neighbors. We had the Tuckers, brother Tucker, and he was some old funny kind of, wasn't crotchety, but he's always driving big machines and his wife was super nice and she was always good to us and up the hill, we had Sister Bunnell, and when you learned how to read, she would crochet you a bookmark. And then we had Brother and Brother Perry, or Mr. Perry. Mr. Perry. Because they weren't LDS, so they weren't brother, but he's the one that had the stagecoach and stored some other things on our property. He had a boat down there and once dad went out of town and he gave me the uh combination to his shed his shop we knew where he had like his german dagger and all of his tools and stuff and i was the man of the house while he was gone and i opened up the shop and justin and i would get out tools and mess around and we got these two things called pickaroons and they're like an axe with a point on them they're used to like rolling logs and something with lumber and anyway we got these pickaroons we're wandering around the property playing with them and then mr perry had this like little old rowboat it was probably on a trailer but it was upside down it was wooden and we went and punched a bunch of holes in it just complete vandalism just swinging these pickaroons and puncturing holes so we had to eventually we got caught and had to go apologize and talk to him and he was a really nice guy was this big guy and he he limped and he had a cane and he wore real low rider pants so his his belt around his waist was low and i didn't know what low riders were but he appeared to not have a like a butt because the way is like his <laughs> pockets were hanging low and the way he limped around with a cane i always thought he had his butt shot off in a war or something 
<laughs> that we couldn't say that word. It was bottom. Well, you're right. <laughs> and there was one year, they were good to us. The Perrys were good to us. I remember one year, I was, I would have been pretty little. And they called up on Christmas and they said, oh, well, Santa got a little lost there. He left some things for your kids here. And, and they, we had one or two presents each that they had, they're probably just the three of us at that time. And Sean may have been a baby, but we got <clears throat> Christmas presents from Santa, the Perry's. We'd go up and feed their dogs occasionally too. You remember that? Yeah. He had those basset hounds. It was it, always... who, who was the, was it the Eggerson? Somebody used to hit golf balls from the bench up above us into our pasture. Yeah, it was probably Eggerson's. They were kind of punks. Yeah, their Lee house, was. They were they were big golfers. Their house was so ugly. It was this big concrete cinder block. It was just this big cinder block box. It was so ugly. <laughs> Well, at least it wasn't covered in foam and pyrocrete. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when dad got a, a a big thermos jug and sprayed it with foam and then carved out the spigot? So it's it was probably still around when he died. But there was this big... Oh, it was. <laughs> kept the water... Well, it was in his garage when we went through his stuff. Pulled us water around. Yeah, I mean, because it was, yeah, an insulated thermos with three more inches of insulation on it. North of us, between our, our place and Mariotti's place, was like a church canning area. And it was no, I don't ever remember it being used, but this huge warehouse with you know, places for to park semi trailers and load things. And anyway, living right near there was a guy named Garn Baum. And we we're always, when, at least me, going from our house to Mariotti is somehow I was always scared of Garn Baum or never wanted to, any dealings with <laughs> him. And I wouldn't even remember. Him, him or his wife or what they looked like well, but they seemed rich they had a fancy house and, and it wasn't a, I mean, it wasn't it was it was a fancy house but it wasn't this great big tall house chapman's barn was bigger than that but i always remember the the rumor of garn bomb has an elevator in his house but i think <laughs> right. it was a rambler <laughs> so i don't know I do. I just had a memory of uh, a spook alley. I think that Tent View was brand new school and they did a spook alley. I remember going there and there was a guy dressed up like Frankenstein and he had it strapped to his feet were, um, what would you Brief call it? Briefcases. Little, yeah. Like literally briefcases were, the sole, were on the bottoms of his feet. So he was huge, tall. I remember going into that spook alley, and I think you two went, and I didn't dare go. And I think I sat out front in what would have been the commons and cried. Well, how I remember it is somehow Lisa heard of this spook alley and got all excited and talked mom into going. And so mom dropped us off and then went to Mary Ward's, and the three of us tried to get in, and there was an admission. Of course, we're clueless, so some high school kid paid our admission and then we started in the spook alley and it went from the commons down towards the basketball and the locker rooms and you know how on that west side of the locker rooms when you come out of the locker rooms there's like a weird skinny hallway you remember that as when you're in high school and somewhere in there you got so scared they took you out of it well, and maybe and then, me too. I don't. I don't remember if I went through the whole thing. I don't remember either. But I. I what I remember most about that is the the dude with the briefcases on his feet, and then there was a little narrow staircase that probably went up to, like where the weights were or something. 
and they had taken old, I mean, it was a brand new high school. It was, I think it was brand new the year I was in sixth grade, but they took these old warped boards and laid them across the stairs. So as you walked up, it was all rickety and wobbly. And then we walked over, so we left Timview, we walked over to Mary Ward's and we were knocking on her door. And then, I don't know if it was some neighbor kids or something, they were probably high school age kids. And they may have even been working at the spook alley, but they showed up in their, their big costumes and we ran screaming from the door. We just bolted there like, no, no, it's okay. We won't hurt you, it's okay. <laughs> so then we, went back to where, and we may have been trick-or-treating around that neighborhood too, because we had, we had some friends in that neighborhood. That's where Robbie Duncan had lived. All right. He lives there right now. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Well, before, I remember dad driving us up in Sherwood Hills and riding horses up there a little bit before Tim View was built before very many homes, you know, Indian Hills was there, but not that's North stuff. Yeah. Those were all like up Quail Valley. There was really nothing up there yet. Yeah, was, that well, neighborhood just north of Tim View was there. And, and, and like you said, Indian Hills. Did the Quail Valley Road exist up the one up east up the hill? There were some roads. I, I personally can't recollect if that was actually a dirt road that was there then or if they, it must have been. If you, you think if you go up there, there's not a lot of ways up there. I don't think they could have rerouted it very well. It's a pretty steep road. So it probably was. And it certainly at one point would have been when we were going up into that area, you know, we're just on unimproved roads maybe even gravel still <coughs> and the road that goes from university avenue by where will's pit stop is up to canyon road went a different it curved left and went around quite a ways and the road that's there now is basically the dirt trail that we walked to and from school but it yeah. was yeah, it wasn't a road then. Well, in 1978, we moved to 199 Spruce Avenue in Shelley, Idaho. It was about a block attended, from high school. Yeah. We attended school there. Justin and I went to the Dean Goodsell School, which was K through sixth grade, and one fifth grade class, which I attended, and all the rest of the fifth graders bust out of town to Taylor, to the Taylor School that was only for fifth graders. And so I was, I was the- Go ahead. So I was a new kid in fifth grade. And then the next year, they built the Hazel T. Stewart School, which was fourth, fifth, and sixth. So Justin and I moved to that school, and all the fifth graders moved back. So I was the new kid again, because I never <laughs> knew any of the fifth graders. What are the stories about you getting in trouble for being the, the new kid and not knowing what to do with yourself? Yeah, we'll let Justin say what he was going to first. Well, so I, I was in third grade, and we lived, We went to that big school, and it was at least a two-story, and it was old when we were there. Uh, but anyway, I went to play football at recess, and you didn't get to play football at the fifth graders. And some through some weird mistake, I got to play football with Willis for a minute, and some some girl that was a – tomboy could play football and they called her Mo. Anyway, I caught a pass somewhere along the line and then I was cool because I was a third grader and I caught this pass. So somebody called me Willie Jr. So I went into my teacher, Mr. Jackson, and I said, my name's not Justin. My name's Willie Jr. <laughs> <laughs> she, said, 
call me Willie Jr. in school. <laughs> <laughs> How long did that last? I don't know, but I wrote it as long as I could. <laughs> well, I think you were called Willie Jr. by my grade the rest of the time we lived there. <laughs> Out on the playground, kids, don't you think? Probably, yeah. At least Mitch Mansfield and Mo and some of those kids, you know, it's, it was pretty remarkable. They let you play. Yeah. I mean, football there was sacred. At recess, you didn't have time to mess around. And if you couldn't play football, you weren't very important very long. And, and we wasn't... didn't. Go ahead. Well, we didn't, when we moved there, we didn't know football. We had been playing soccer in Provo and, you know, we played with a football. I don't know how you call it now, but it was smear the queer then. And we would play it at Edgemont and you weren't supposed to, but we still did sometimes. And we played a game in our yard in Provo called Duchesne, but we didn't know the rules of football and we could go to the high school. We could crawl under the high school chain link fence in a little low spot we'd sneak under there and then we'd go play on the football field and our neighbors in that neighborhood taught Willis and I all the rules about football. Yeah. Travis Adams, our neighbor across yeah. the street and, and we'd go watch Jason the... Norland down the street. Yeah. And you'd go watch the Super Bowl at Travis Adams and decided to be Steelers fans. We were Steelers fans way before that. That was the only game we got to watch that entire year. We didn't have a TV. Right. We we got a, an oven that had a microwave in the oven when we were there. That was the first microwave we ever had. And it just was mind-blowing that you could warm something up. I remember <laughs> that felt so revolutionary. <laughs> I mean, but you had to like put it in the whole oven on this little tiny ceramic thing right in the middle and then do this weird locking motion with the oven door and it would be absolutely pathetic and inefficient by today's standards. Yeah. So that reminds me, when I was in probably second grade, dad brought home a calculator and he brought, gathered us around and he opened this box and he pulled out the styrofoam insulation and out came this calculator wrapped in plastic and he could plug it into the wall and plug it in to the calculator and you could calculate numbers and I mean it was like now if you came home with the newest Mac something <laughs> or other or and, a and, you know, car. It, it, it was a big it was, deal it was a big deal and you had to get permission from him to use it and you couldn't really use it on your math because you had to learn it. And the next year in third grade, I was sitting next to Derek in class. <laughs> I was just like, I thought he was the richest kid in the world to have his own calculator. <laughs> well, in the entire time we had dad's calculator, You'd, you'd put it back in the styrofoam, in the plastic, and then in the styrofoam casing, and then in the the box that it came in, and then in the, sh the cardboard shipping box. Like, it was like this big sacred thing to be able to touch the calculator and keep it really protected. Yeah. And when we were in Shelly in that house, it was in, it was in the town, of course, and it seemed like it snowed so much. We played so much in deep snow and it would drift. And sometimes the drifts would be just so deep you could tunnel through them. And it, it was a blast for as kids to have so much snow to play in. Well, and it was cool too, cause we were in town and so we, we could do stuff, <clears throat> but half the kids were bussed in from out of town. So when it would snow a lot and then the wind would blow and everything would drift and the roads would drift, they'd close school so that they didn't have, you know, 200 kids trapped in the school. And we, so we had a lot of school snow days and we never had to make them up. And so we, but we were in town, so we'd like go slide down the street or go play on the football field or 
whatever. And it was never a big fat inconvenience to be, to have a snow day, even though then when we moved out to Jamestown and it was a snow day, we were snowed in. We still had fun though. So Willis, talk about being the, the new kid and <laughs> behavior problems. Well, I, uh, I remember learning fractions in fourth grade and I was always good with math once I figured it out. And we go to Shelley and we're learning fractions in fifth grade and I'm bored out of my mind. Did he pause for you guys or just me? Yeah. Yeah, I think he froze. He's been freezing slightly off and on most of the night. Read. You know, if I read, melted all my crayons down it. Make all these beautiful colors. And, and, you know, I'm some new kid trying to be cool. And I was always throwing crayons when the teacher wasn't looking. all things you got to bend over and grab your ankles and they whack you with a bat or a paddle so then in sixth grade like I said I was still the new kid most of the kids in my class I didn't know and we started all these weird things we were we would roll dice to win things and we had these little clubs and we're always rolling dice and betting and trading tacks like push pins, but we would get the flat tacks and we'd put them on people's chairs all the time. So oh somebody get up and go do something, they come back and sit on a tack. And then we figured out if they sit on a tack, they lean up to get the tack their bum. So we would tape a tack on the back of their chair. So you'd sit down and you'd lean up and you'd put your back in another tack. And so you always had to be careful to get tacked. <laughs> and I was just always screwing around. And one of the worst things that that teacher was Mr. Miguel. And he was single guy, pretty young. He was probably pretty cool. I think we were just brats, but he got fed up with me at one point for being such a goof off. He put my desk, he could. <sighs> Dang it. We'll have to tell him to retell that one. Yeah, it's frustrating. Hires for yourself because whenever he wasn't looking, whenever he was, yeah. Well, guy, that, right when you started telling that story, your internet went down. Oh, did it? Yeah. So, right when you said he, he had to move your desk. Okay. So he moved my desk next to his desk facing the classroom. So he gave me an audience. <laughs> so whenever he wasn't looking, I had 30 kids looking at me. I could <laughs> do anything I wanted. Oh, my gosh. Um, so I don't know Tim and he always paddled us and he hit hard he had a long paddle with holes drilled in it to have less air resistance I mean there were there were you know there were actually bad kids in my class like kids that you know would get caught stealing and chewing tobacco and we had kids that smoked pot at recess stuff that didn't even seem real to me. I didn't even, I, I don't even, I didn't really, I knew they were smoking marijuana, but I didn't really even understand what that meant till years later. Like how the heck were sixth graders smoking pot? Well, when we moved out to Jamestown and we can circle back to being in town, but there was this kid that lived up the street from us a ways 
that rode our bus, Gavin Arby. He's about the biggest stoner I've ever met. And he Gavin was, Arby? Yeah, he was a sixth grader and he'd get on the bus high every day. And he told me he was taking acid. Now, I don't know if he was, but <laughs> it wouldn't have surprised me. But he'd get on the bus and his eyes would just be glazed and he'd just be like, yeah, I put acid in my Coke. And I think he meant Coca-Cola, but at least he was regularly smoking pot. But, <clears throat> well, I learned about cold weather when we lived in Jameson, because I was the girly girl that liked to wear the dresses and the sh fancy shoes. And technically, we lived close enough to town that I had to walk to school, and it was it was across town. It wasn't, a, it was probably a half mile or more, but there was a really cool bus driver because, because all the kids lived out of, or so many lived, kids lived out of town. They would, the bus would go to the elementary school, then the junior high, then the high school. And so she'd let me ride the bus from the junior high to the high school. And then I'd get off at the high school and walk across the high school field and home. So it was winter and it was cold and it was snowy and I was wearing open-toed sandals and walked home just across the, the lawn at the high school and there was, you know, fairly deep snow, but there were snowmobile tracks. So I walked in the snowmobile tracks and did not get my feet in the snow because I was careful about walking in the tracks. And then I got home and it, it was probably a five minute walk and my toes hurt so, so bad and they just hurt and they hurt and, and nobody else was there and I was home by myself and we had the little heaters on the baseboard heaters and I put my toes up next to the baseboard and they were so, and, and that they just hurt and hurt and hurt. Figured out I had frostbite because it was 40 below. And I hadn't figured out, oh, well, cold air will ruin, you know, is like a bad thing, not just snow. And so I think dad was probably a little disgusted that I wasn't smart enough to not wear open toed sandals in the winter, but I didn't get to snow on them. I was careful. So yeah, I, I had frostbitten toes in the seventh grade. <clears throat> It's that it's that, up. Go ahead. Yeah, and in that place, literally by some miracle, I I can will never comprehend. Mom bought Willis and I two new bikes, BMX bikes. They were the brand was Rampar. They were black and they had yellow pads. And I think if I remember right, the cost was a hundred and three dollars each. Yeah. And that stuck in my brain. And I literally have no idea how we convinced her to do that. But I remember driving, riding my bike to school and parking it in the little bike racks. And, and this kid coming out like, that is a number one. And he was so <laughs> excited. And that kind of started Willis and I on this whole BMX thing, which lasted for years in our, in our lives. Um, and the only bad thing is Shelly had a bunch of those stupid stickers people call goat heads and we we're always fighting flat tires yeah yeah you guys got bikes and i got my ears pierced <laughs> well in in edgemont right before we moved lots of people were like bmx bikes were getting cool and you know because remember jeff thorne always had cool bmx bikes and yeah, some neighbor had a Nashiki that was the coolest thing. Yeah. Well, so, and then go ahead. Some, I know this was years later, but at some point you guys were riding BMX tracks. That's basically where the Riverwood Shopping Center is now, right? It's where you were where there was a BMX track. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I moved from Jameson to from Chile out to Jameson, which was a few miles away, and we lived in a double wide trailer and kind of southwest of us was our cousins, the South, Barry and his kids. And then to the north 
east of us a hair, not far away, what, less than a quarter mile, was David South. So they were brothers. So we grew up in between two families of cousins. And we were able to have all kinds of adventures in that place. We had a, a creek right behind our house. We had trees all over. We had bike paths and foot paths and forests. And we had BB guns and we had sand to play in. And we had rabbits and we could make stuff with wood. And, uh, and there was sand dunes close by. We'd go to the sand dunes all the time. It was just another time where I think it was just idyllic for kids that wanted to be outside. And we hadn't been, we'd been there a few months when David and his family moved to Manan and the Pratt family moved in to David's house. They bought David's house, but, uh, and Mike. And they Pratt, moved from Aberdeen. <laughs> yeah. Mike Pratt was my age. And then Tanya was your age, right, Willis? No, she was younger than me. Okay. She was between Justin and I, and Brian was a year older than me. Okay. Anyway, we had a lot of fun with them, and their dad was cool. He built a rope swing over Sand Creek, and so we could swing in that, and he'd go play in the creek with us sometimes. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty fun. <laughs> and, oh, oh, this is terrible. I almost don't even want to remember it. Um, <clears throat> so in Idaho, you can drive when you're 14, or at least you could back then, um, daytime only. And we were, so dad wanted to make sure, he was thinking about moving back to Provo, but he wanted to make sure I took driver's ed so that I didn't have to do it again. So I was 14 and taking driver's ed. And there was one day I was going to practice driving because I had my permit and take us, I think we're going to the sand dunes. So mom and I were in the cab of dad's blue Chevy pickup and all of the little, yeah, Willis and Justin and all the younger kids and probably the Pratt kids and the Hyatt kids, which lived down the road a ways. Anyway, a hundred kids in the back of the pickup and they were all making fun of me trying to back out of the driveway. and. And I'd do something and they'd yell and scream and make fun of me. And so mom said, just ignore them, just ignore them. And I was having to back up and pull forward because I wasn't turning sharp enough or something. And there was a little pine tree and I actually backed over it and everybody was screaming to warn me, but they'd been screaming so long and so much that it was like the boy who cried wolf. And so when they were telling me to stop backing over the pine tree, I just completely ignored them because I didn't know there's anything else different until I felt like thud and <laughs> took out this little pine tree. In that, in that double wide trailer, mom and dad bought a van and we called it the hippie van. It looked like the van from the movie, the eight from the show, the A team It had wide mag tires on the back probably it was kind of on a little bit of an angle kind of jacked up and it it, it came with an eight track player and it had an, an ABBA eight track we listened to a billion times but in the back of the van there wasn't seats and mom just had a box a wooden box with pillows and blankets in it and so if you were two and or the three box years, was up on sorry the box was up on uh Cinder block. Cinder block. <laughs> so if you were a little kid, you just dumped in this box. I think there was a back bench seat. Yeah. I yeah. remember laying on the floor behind the back bench seat and listening to, like you said, there was an ABBA seat, an ABBA eight track, and then Sound of Music. And, and a we, bunch of Johnny Cash and Elvis. I don't remember those. I just remember ABBA Fernando. <laughs> And money, money, money. And mom was pregnant with you at the time, Tim. And she said, to this day, some of those ABBA songs make her feel nauseous. <laughs> <laughs> she equates it to the morning sickness. But there was one night she was taking me to meet South in Idaho Falls. So David's kids, like Nanette and Manny. And we were driving up some road and she started to go through the intersection. She got broadsided and it was dark. And I'm 
looking back, I'm positive the other driver didn't have their lights on and mom didn't see him. And this lady comes flying out of her car and she's like, you hurt my baby. You hurt all of mine. Well, I'm pregnant. So am I. Well, my baby's breech. So is mine. <laughs> so this, this hysterical lady and mom's just sitting there with this van full of kids and the impact had knocked the box off the cinder blocks and there were kids piled everywhere and mom got the ticket but I, I do think that woman it was really dark it was I mean probably this time of year um, or you know just a few maybe maybe you're like February or something and still dark early and I don't think that woman had her lights on and so mom couldn't see her car. Anyway. We bought a, mom and dad bought a car they called a Dasher. Just a little car and it was out in front and Joseph at this point was Mr. Cars and Keys and was in love with all that stuff and I don't remember much of the story but I remember at one point the Dasher was in the field because Joseph had figured out how to turn it on and get it into gear and I wasn't tall enough to reach the pedals and see out over the steering wheel. Mom had turned it on to warm it up. And she was getting one kid after another out there. And yeah, she put, she put him in or, and then came out with another kid. It's like, wait, where's the car? What's going on? And it was, yeah, off in the field. Well, we should probably... We should probably uh, pause on the Joseph stories without him here to tell it him from his <laughs> own perspective. Yeah. Yeah. We we've been going about an hour. Should we should we call this and then do it again and get some more of your siblings? Yeah. Yeah, I want to remember to have Sean talk about Sean in Shelley. They didn't have kindergarten. So he didn't do kindergarten. And then in first grade, he got, he got paddled for kissing yeah. girls at recess. So I'd like to see if he remembers that part of the story himself. Willis and I in the new Hazel T. Stewart school and some kid. Let me finish the Dasher story. Oh. Oh, go ahead. We can't hear you. Can you now? Yeah. 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 I was saying the Dasher story, it was the little Volkswagen and mom was doing what Lisa said and Ruth put it in gear and drove it off. And Joseph was so disgusted that she didn't know how to turn the key off to stop it or something. And Tim's right. We need Joseph to tell the story, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's like, Did, why don't you put it in, take it out of gear or turn the key or something course you know ruth's like what are you talking about <laughs> well yeah. how old was ruth and joseph when that happened ruth was born and set ruth four i was only in fourth grade yeah so joseph was probably five yeah so mom told me that joseph was like why don't you pull the emergency breaker? Why don't you shift it out of gear? Why don't you do this? Or why don't you turn the key off? Like he was like five and he already knew all the ways to drive a car. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let me totally. tell you one other thing while I'm thinking about it. Um, so we had a kind of a fire pit out behind this, our trailer and we burned garbage back there. And there was one night I was babysitting and and we were out we probably shouldn't have been burning garbage but we were out burning garbage and and playing with the milk jugs as they melted which we shouldn't have burned either we should have anyway and so it was drippy melty plastic and ruth stepped on it and of course just started screaming and so I thought her foot was dirty and I tried to, to brush it off and I, it wouldn't brush off because it wasn't just soot, it was melted plastic and had to run over and get Judy South to help out. 
I don't remember if we took Ruth to the doctor, but I remember feeling so bad that I had hurt her, that, that I was in charge when she got hurt. Yeah. You got one more, Justin? Yeah, just, we were at recess in the back of the school and some kid was giving me a hard time and I decided I'd had enough and I want to stand up for myself. So the kid was looking at me and we were in this discussion and Willis snuck up behind the kid and knelt down on his hands and knees to give me something to push the kid over, <laughs> to push him over backwards over, the, over Willis who was sneaking behind him. Do you remember that Willis? Yeah, it was Danny Empey. Danny Empey. Then, then he and I got in a fight. Remember, we were punching each other because the punk. Huh? Because I'm trying to remember, he was just always picking on you, and he had a brother your age. And I think they were in our ward, but they were kind of less active. And anyway, I just know that once he and I actually got in a fight. Mm. and um, uh, Gavin Matthews knelt behind him, and I I punched him in the chest and it toppled him over. Anyway, they took us to the principal's office, and they were going to suspend us both, but they couldn't get either of our moms on the phone, so they sent us back to class. <laughs> we never got suspended. I don't know how we communicated in the moment that – you were going to sneak up and do that. I don't know. I don't know if I just realized when you got there, but it, I, looking back, it surprises me that we had a coordinated attack. Well, it was kind of like a dome chain thing. Like people were always trying to sneak behind somebody, just buddies screwing around and you'd push them over somebody. Remember yeah. that? A little bit. So it was kind of a fun gag thing to like set your buddies up. So that's yeah. kind of how you would have known that, oh, he's he's in the spot that I can push this kid over. Shelly was this weird anomaly of violence and drugs right. from our little sheltered Edgemont school life to go there. It was crazy. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to pause. Okay. okay. All right.